When I started, things like license compliance was still a little bit uncertain. Uh, there was some ambiguity around whether actual litigation in court would be effective with licenses. And of course, thanks to time from individuals like Harold Velte, thanks to law firms like JG, JBB led by Till Yeager, uh, those issues were ironed out and open source licensing became a lot clearer, a lot easier to understand. Now, in recent years, a lot of the discussion around open source license compliance has been about how to make it as consistent, as effective, and as efficient as possible. So, of course, when we're dealing with, say, commercial use of open source, we do have to try to make sure that very long supply chains can have effective open source license compliance. And that is not as simple as telling people they should know the terms of the license and they should use it. It requires a great deal of education and it requires effective process management. So in some ways in 15 years, we've swung from the advocacy and basic proof phase into the process management phase of open source license compliance and more generally open source governance. And that introduces some complexity but it also introduces clarity. And today I want to talk about how we actually have created an ISO standard for open source license compliance, where it comes from, where it's going, and what that means for you, whether you're an individual developer, you're a small company, or a multinational. So to get started, around 2015, a discussion kicked off between various lawyers, mostly at the time. Um, about what would be the key requirements of an open source compliance program. You know, what are the absolute must-haves? And various approaches to outlining those key requirements were noodled. <laughs> people thought, what if we had checklists explaining everything? And then people reanalyzed it and said, a checklist will be inherently suitable for a certain company size and market sector. How do we make this universal? So by 2016, the Open Chain project was formally created and designed to do this, to create a clear, short specification that outlined the key requirements of open source compliance without making it burdensome, without making it market specific, uh, and without making it company uh, size specific. Now, people are very familiar often with things like open source tooling. For instance, Fossology, um, Turn, we have things like reuse software as an approach to managing software. Uh, a little higher than that, up in the stack, more abstract, you've got software bill of materials like SPDX. Now, OpenChain decided to take the very top level, the high level process management, and to focus the energy there. In other words, Open Chain is designed to set the foundation and the framework where people apply software bill of materials, tooling, and so on. So the idea that was implemented is to define inflection points. And in the particular case of Open Chain, to define in a company at what inflection point do you need to put a process. So, you know, inbound understand what software is coming in under what license, internally have training policy and processes, and outbound, understand what's going out under what license. These are very foundational things, but it's very important to clearly describe them so that companies can implement in process management. And whether they're doing it through pre-existing um, software management processes or they're implementing it for the first time, this frames what they do at open source licensing. And the goal for open chain is to make the supply chain more conformant, to make sure that mistakes don't occur. So company by company, as people adopt open chain, the chance of errors is dramatically reduced and just as important because everyone's using the same process management. If something happens, you can go very quickly through the supply chain and find out where there's a broken link and fix it. So this essentially dramatically reduces complexity, 
and increases efficiency, two of the major things we needed to get done to really get this solved. And just as a side note, the supply chain is enormously complex. It's quite rare to have a product come to market that isn't touched by 20 or more companies. So it's, it's really vital that we have a methodology for doing this. Now, OpenChain went to market in uh, October 2016. And by April 2019, uh, we'd had a few iterations of the standard. We had enormous growth in terms of community engagement from companies and also multiple sector growth. So it was very clear the standard was working, the current iteration was solid, and it was time to think about how we turn it from a de facto industry standard into a formal international standard. So in April 2020, we submitted it into a special process in ISO, where you literally convert an uh, a de facto industry standard into a formal standard. So it's not a re-editing process or anything like that. It's a conversion process. Submitted it in April last year. We graduated in December. And therefore, we now have an ISO uh, standard for open source license compliance. Uh, now let's talk about what that really means. So at the very basic level, if people are conformant to ISO 5230, or Open Chain 2.1, you know that they have the key requirements of a quality open source compliance program in place. That ranges from training the appropriate people through to having internal and external touch points for compliance questions. Uh, these facts are very useful to know, both for anyone who wants to ask the company a question or internally for the company staff who need to respond. The type of entities supporting this international standard are very diverse. Um, so here's the platinum members of the project. These are the board companies. And as you can see, it's everyone from Silicon with ARM and Qualcomm through to cloud with companies uh, like Google and Microsoft. And the diversity of these companies in market sector is only the beginning of the illustration of how diverse the actual project is. There's many hundreds of companies involved, uh, plenty of individuals involved. And when it comes to market sectors, when it comes to industry areas, it's remarkable. Uh, they, I'll give you two examples just for fun. Uh, one is that a few months ago, an ethical bank in Myanmar became open chain conformant. Uh, another major, major <laughs> engagement with open chain and contributor has been Philip Morris International in Switzerland because of their work on the iKios electric uh, cigarette. You know, we're talking about a massive diversity of companies all around the world being touched uh, by the International Standard for Open Source Compliance. And of course, the Platinum members are the key driver of this, uh, but the community as a whole has terrific local activity, terrific subject matter groups, and uh, they, uh, the outreach is exceptional. So when it comes to companies that are adopting the open chain standard, uh, it, it varies, it moves really quickly. And not all companies get listed on our website. Uh, it's an optional thing. But here are some examples of people using ISO uh, right now or equivalent. So it's companies like Toyota, it's companies like Cisco, it's Microsoft and so on. And these companies, of course, are influencing their supply chains and accelerating the adoption, and that helps clean up everything for everyone. Now, there's also companies who are conformant with previous versions of the specification before it was ready for ISO, um, and some of them are converting. So one company that just converted on this slide is Hitachi, which just announced a couple of days ago that they've moved to the ISO conformant program. And we've got a bunch more announcements in the pipeline. It's exciting, it's great. And we're very glad uh, to see companies not only adopting OpenChain, but gradually coalescing around the ISO standard itself. Now I mentioned the community is incredible, and it is. So we have a global mailing list with almost 4,000 subscribers. 
Uh, we've got global automotive and reference tooling work groups. The reference tooling work group actually meets every two weeks, which is exceptionally frequent. We've got China, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Germany, and US work groups. Um, and uh, we have just recently added, first of all, an education work group for the globe and also an Indian work group for a local region, a significant local region. And these, these communities aren't just talking, they're creating stuff like supplier education leaflets, uh, new types of checklists and so on. So let's explain what I meant by that. The standard is a specification. It's basically seven relatively widely spaced uh, pages of text saying you should do this to accomplish this. And you can read the standard to adopt it, or you can use something like our online self-certification questionnaire, which is free and private. People use it actually for self-certification, but more generally for health checks, and anyone can go there and join in. Uh, but when it comes to actually doing that, adopting a standard, whether you choose to read the specification or to use our self-certification questionnaire, people often have a lot of questions. Um, we aren't prescriptive. We don't say you have to have this training program or that open source policy. Like I said, any company, any size, any market, any culture. But we do try to provide reference material to help people answer the questions and answer yes. And if they can't answer yes today, they can pick up some reference material and build from there. The material is extremely comprehensive. From case studies with companies like Toyota to reference training slides built out of information from Qualcomm, Samsung, Philips, ARM, and others, uh, to translations in multiple languages. We keep a bunch of it on the website. For example, the curriculum and supplier education is first touch once you get to our website. Uh, but it's really on GitHub where you'll find just the epic amount of material contributed from all over the world as uh, companies and individuals and law firms share the information so that anyone can get references about pretty much anything when it comes to open source compliance. It's, it's well worth a look at that. Um, and it's in multiple languages. Not everything is translated by everyone. It tends to be communities translate their stuff of interest, but it's certainly significant. And uh, apart from the specification itself, and apart from the case studies where it's like Toyota did this, everything else is public domain. It's CC0. Uh, this is a purposeful step on our poor part because we want people to incorporate all the knowledge anywhere they want without any restrictions. Uh, and that's been tremendously successful, tremendously successful. Now, the project is companies solving their own problem. But part of that discussion has also been, how do we get support? How do we make sure that, let's say, a small company in Germany who is working on open source license compliance now, they're adopting open chain, but they have a question. Who do they ask it to? And we've worked to build out a partner program with entities that have information about open source have information about open chain and have made a clear commitment to explaining open chain to their customer base and the people who come along. So here's an example of law firms. I mentioned Till and his law firm JBB in Germany. It's a, an exceptional, exceptional law firm. ID Law Partners in Spain is another example. GTC in the United States, Osborne Clark, UK, uh, Array Law, Italy. All over the world, law firms with a lot of experience in this field and some great people are available to help. Uh, we also now work with a lot of service providers. Uh, each of the service providers here has engaged with the project. Um, they've come to understand it and they've reached agreements with us regarding how they will both explain and advocate open chain and the, um, the optics, the way they'll do that. And of course, we have some vendors and so on. Most of the tooling vendors are relatively recent to the open chain program. 
And just like everyone else, uh, they've committed to both understanding clearly what we do and also understanding things like the Open Chain project doesn't recommend anything in particular, of course. Uh, but you know, by and large, our user companies, when they talk about tooling, are mostly talking about open source tooling for open source compliance. And our tooling vendors are fully aware of that. Uh, and they know that when it comes to, let's say, talking about tooling, what we really want to do is make sure there's perfect interoperability. It should be perfectly possible to scan with Fossology in one place in your company, scan with white source in another, use Foss ID elsewhere, and all the information just to flow perfectly through all of that stuff using something like ingest and export of SPDX. And we've got third-party certifiers. Uh, so I'm not going to go into too much detail on that, but basically you can self-certify to the standard or you can get help or you can literally get someone to do it for you, like PricewaterhouseCooper or Duke said. It's been really cool on the third-party certification. We honestly don't expect that to be, by any measure, the majority of what happens in the project. Self-certification, we believe, will always be the majority. And then independent um, assessment support, and then much smaller third-party certification. But in areas like automotive, aviation, defense, it's very important to have third-party certification. And we already have it. We're really glad that before, we became an ISO standard. We had all of this in place. So uh, when it comes to adopting a standard like this, I mentioned different ways. Self-certification is where you literally do it yourself. And that's what a lot of people do. Uh, a lot of companies do that. Like, uh, I'll give you an example. Microsoft did that. They self-certified. So did Google. Um, so did Qualcomm. So did ARM. But some companies want to have someone come in and double check the self-certification, maybe offer some advice. It could be a law firm, it could be a service provider like YPRO. And that's independent compliance assessment where someone just drops in, helps you out. Or in some cases, maybe your customer company said, oh, thank you supplier, it's great that you're self-certified, but I wanna have uh, you know, JBB just check you out. And then there's third-party certification where someone does it for you. And naturally, you can see that self-certification is the cheapest, and then it gets more expensive from there. But those people who are investing in third-party certification, it's a significant part of their market requirements. Now, I do have details about what each of these things is, but I'm going to skim over that just to say that self-certification is the heart of Open Chain. You know, this is vitally important. It works, and it's available at this URL anytime for anyone, company, individual, whatever, go play. And when we were starting 2016, there were some concerns. Will people misuse self-certification? Will they say that they are certified when they're not? And after now, amazingly, about five years in market, uh, the answer is no. In fact, the problem, if any, that we've had is that people tend to overshoot rather than undershoot. So people tend to go process heavy rather than process light. And we've yet to have anyone uh, misrepresent what they're doing in self-certification. I think it's probably because one of the parts of our self-certification, the final part basically says, uh, document how you did it. And that means any customer company can just be like, okay, show me that, show me that documentation. Independent assessment, like I said, someone comes in, law firm, consultancy, accounting firm, and they just see what you did, and they might have some suggestions. Uh, this is very popular in some areas. We actually, to be honest, borrowed this from functional safety, where the ISO 26262 functional safety standard explicitly has uh, independent compliance, well, independent security assessment for them. And uh, yeah, it's, it's actually pretty popular. I think a lot of companies like the sanity check of having someone you know, saying what they think. Uh, and it's cost efficient as well. You know, you can pay for as much as you want. The third party certification, I'll just give an example. PwC has a whole software um, asset management platform and they can implement the processes for you. 
so that you'll be open chain conformant and third party certified. And whether it's PWC or said they're going to give you a literal certificate saying that they certified you. Uh, you know, I, like I said, I think that's really something for automotive, aviation, defense, those kind of people. It's not something that would be super common in consumer electronics, probably. Let's see. Let's see. But the big point is this. We have built a standard that identifies the actual inflection points where things can go wrong, where we know things have gone wrong. And we know that if people put processes here, things are much less likely to go wrong and much more likely to be fixed. So it's a very simple, elegant idea. And after all these years in market, we know that self-certification is working well. And having enormous companies like Toyota self-certify is proof of scaling. And it inspires the rest of the automotive industry. We have built support for this project. All of that reference material, all of the stuff like the partners who explicitly worked with us on this. Um, and we seek to make sure everyone's got freedom of choice to get license compliance right, but there's no ambiguity in the process, process management that people need. And if there's one thing I'd like you to take away, it's that Open Chain Project is run by user companies for user companies. You know, these are the people with the problem solving the problem. And this means an extremely clear, extremely effective vision for getting this right. As few problems as possible likely to occur. As quick remediation as possible likely to occur. And of course, clarity. So, so much less is spent on digging through uncertainty and bespoke approaches. We'd love for you to be part of this. Individual or company, every mind counts. You can join our community by going to the Open Chain Project website. And like I said, you can go to the self-certification or health check and just play around with it and see what the standard's like, uh, what the questions are. Go have a look at our reference material. And there I wrap it up. I think uh, Sam gave me a, a 10 minute warning there. Uh, so we've got about five left, I suppose, for any questions if you have them. Thank you so much, Shane. We do have a little extra time for questions, and this is a, a broad and potentially technical topic which affects many of the audience members directly, I imagine. I'm not seeing questions just yet. Please go ahead and add them in the chat or in the questions tab. And in the meantime, I have a question for you, Shane, which is about the number of firms which I've seen increasingly selling uh, compliance services for open source, firms like White Source, Fossa, Sneak. Uh, I'm sure you're aware of these and, uh, and some of their marketing. And I, I wonder whether you feel that they're solving genuine important legal issues, these companies, and helping with compliance of different kinds, including potentially open chain, or if you feel that they're adding unnecessary doubt to the to the sector. Like, do they complement your work with open chain, or, or how does the commercial ecosystem fit? I like that question. I think uh, the history of the commercial ecosystem has been relatively negative. So 10 years ago, a lot of the service providers were using extremely negative language about open source compliance. So my perspective is that started in a bad place. Um, and I, I, I certainly wasn't happy with the marketing I saw 15 years ago, 10 years ago. It was basically open source is dangerous. We'll help constrain it for you. I think that the messaging has got a lot, a lot better. I think user companies got tired of the endless negativity and they just didn't believe it. I mean, it's very hard to tell a major corporation using open source that it's a terrible thing if they've spent a decade knowing it's not. And I think that has helped change the market message. In the context of open chain, our strategy with working with vendors is to bring them in with our partner agreement and essentially frame their services in the context of open chain in the way that we talk about open chain. So we're trying to encourage the companies to have a, a non-negative messaging to focus on actually solving the problems. Like let's say, can we have discoverability? Not that open source is dangerous, but do we have adequate discoverability? And to be honest, I think that is a pretty 
good long-term strategy. I mean, the companies have been moving away from negativity and talking about optimization for a while, but I think things like open chain will boost positive discussion, particularly because if there's one thing open chain is prescriptive about, is that people should have choice. Interoperability should just work. And if people aren't doing that, there's something wrong. And you know, I've said it to all our tooling vendors in the ecosystem, companies like Synopsys with Black Duck or White Source, Foss ID, you know, ultimately they're going to have to have transparent interoperability between each other and the open source tools in the future. Uh, because that's where we're going. I mean, we've got over 160 companies in the tooling work group. Uh, those companies are working on open source tooling for open source compliance. And whether it's, you know, ORT or it's Fossology or scan code, uh, they want it perfectly interoperable. So, yeah, I do think that vendors were in a pretty bad place a decade ago. I think it's getting a lot better. I think, I think things like the Open Chain Partner Program will align the vendors around the interoperability and positive messaging because, well, I mean, these are the user companies coalesced. We've literally made the standard. Uh, the, the kind of, it's like, people have to work with that now. And I want to give credit. I mean, companies like Black Duck, um, well, Synopsys, jumped in to Open Chain very enthusiastically. They've held multiple webinars actively promoting Open Chain. Uh, not in the sense of you must use Black Duck, but more in the sense of this is where the industry is going. Okay, so, and that's great. I think that's exactly what we want to see. Uh, White Source is new. We're just about to kick off some webinars with them, and I expect exactly the same. But anyway, the big picture is Open Chain is agnostic regarding what you do in automation, but we're going to make sure that it suits the user companies. That means interoperability. It means realistic. Uh, risk assessment. It means not pretending that this is terribly dangerous, but at the same time, not pretending that we can ignore licenses. So yeah, the message is getting better. I That's think. encouraging. Thanks. And we have a question also from Lawrence about the self-certification process. He asks if there's any approval given by the Open Chain project itself at the end of that self-cert process. Nope, nothing. I mean, you just tell us you're self-certified and that's it. And there is actually a reason for that. We purposefully decided to use economics to police the standard. Okay, so ultimately it's a supply chain standard. If you are a company in the supply chain and you self-certify, now your customer companies know they can ask you for the section six materials to see what you did. So the fact is that if you're self-certified, if you're talking about it, uh, at some point in the commercial agreements, your customers will say, Okay, show me the what we call the compliance artifacts. So this is how we use the economics to do it. Uh, we don't spend a lot of money. Our budget is, uh, at the moment, it's 20 members, 20,000 each, $400,000 a year. And that means there's no way we could do something like audit companies on our own. But the economic uh, audit has been super effective. You know, suppliers are very happy to be open chain conformant, but I've never met a supplier which was blasé about it, uh, that you know, was not aware that at any minute a customer could say, show me the artifacts. Mm -hmm. And so you've just been discussing there like suppliers and contract law, which mandates the use of open chain. Is that the primary or only use case? Because I'm thinking of startups or smaller organizations or maybe even open source projects who are concerned Ooh, yeah. to be compliant, but they may not have contracts to enforce this, either uh, their compliance or the compliance of other organizations they may have partnerships with. Yes. Uh, so I think when it comes to the supply chain, you basically have the sales cycle, which is more of your advertising copy. So companies like Wind River saying we're open chain conformant. You have procurement cycle, which is likely to go into contracts. But we see open chain used in merger and acquisitions. So both in terms of let's see what this company has in process. And also I've noticed in terms of let's negotiate down their price if they made mistakes, <laughs> which is, again, good because it's in the economics. Once it gets there, it doesn't go away. But it can also apply to projects. And actually, we're noodling on uh, digging further into open chain for projects. It's perfectly viable. It's just a series of process points. And uh, we, there are standards like CII best practices badge, which is security biased and quite detailed. Uh, but we think there might be value for projects in having the process inflection points. And ultimately, 
final upstream is probably where we should land. So speaking to your, your previous answer, Jamie Clark asks for, uh, yeah, he's asking about the general negativity in the corporate realm towards open source, which is quite historical. And I'm sure OpenChain has already done a lot to, to help with because of providing these clear uh, standards and getting them certified uh, by ISO. Do you have anything to say about that from your own perspective about uh, turning yeah. around negativity and fear? I actually do. I have not encountered any significant amount of corporate negativity towards open source. Uh, and this is, I deal with many hundreds of companies. Uh, what I find is that there's often a disconnect where open source developers fear that companies are up to something. And for the most part, companies are up to trying to work out how to use this fast and cheap. So I, it's, I, I have not encountered corporate negativity towards open source, with the exception of 10 or 15 years ago, dealing with banks or you know telcos, which had no idea what this was. But I, I can't think of a single company I've bumped into in the last five years that's negative. I have met companies that are confused, <laughs> but that's a different story. So I think we need to get rid of that. We need to get rid of the idea of this war between developers and companies. It's not real. Um, if it is, I would have seen it in action. I, I'm confident of saying that because I deal with so many companies. Mm -hmm. That's but I get cool. it. Developers don't have great channels into companies. And without that, misunderstandings occur. And the blame is that we don't have the perfect meeting place between companies and developers yet. I mean, Linux Foundation has events. We've got events like FOSDEM. But we don't have a great bridge between corporate management and high-level independent developers. I would love to work on that in the future. That would have to be outside of open chain, though. What might that bridge look like? Uh, would it be technical tooling processes or or what? How do you imagine that? There was a wonderful comment from an elderly Japanese man who was asked, how do we stop war? And he said, we have our children play together. I think if we had conferences with high level developers, independent developers and high level management executives, I think that would work. I don't think it would work just everyone gets together and there's 10,000 people. But if we brought together the right minds, I think that would fix it. Because people would suddenly realize that there's no real barrier except they don't meet 